Well, we have made it to Good Friday. And uh, I've always wondered why we call it Good Friday. I guess because it was good for us. Good Friday wasn't really good for Jesus. It was actually the most difficult day of the Passion Week for Christ. And his journey to the cross and his journey to give us freedom turned treacherous, treacherous and, and, and painful in the final hours that was leading to his death. According to the scriptures, uh, Judas Iscariot, the disciple who had betrayed Jesus, and we already saw that uh, video that night. It was a moving time. If you haven't seen it, you can look back. We have all these recorded. But he was overcome with remorse, and he hanged himself early Friday morning. And then in the ninth hour of the day, it says, or the third hour of the day, which is 9 a.m., uh, Jesus endured uh, the shame of false accusations, condemnation, mockery, beatings, abandonment, all kinds of things, the scourging with the cat of nine tails. And then after multiple unlawful trials, he was sentenced to death by crucifixion. One of the most horrible and disgraceful methods of capital punishment known at that time. Before Christ was led away, soldiers would spit on him, they tormented him, they mocked him, they pierced him, placed a crown of thorns on his head. Then Jesus carried his own cross to Calvary, where again he was mocked and insulted as Roman soldiers nailed him to the wooden cross. Jesus spoke seven final statements on that day. But we have a video that I want to show you. It's about eight minutes long, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking today. I want to let you see this because uh, we've been able to obtain these things from a great group of guys uh, that live uh, close to us. and. Uh, We've been able to put these together and you utilize their talents uh, to let you see more about what really happened on the week uh, of Holy Week. Uh, when I say, when I started this thing, I, you know, I mentioned to all the people that were involved in the production of this, I mentioned to them, I said, you know, these eight days that lead up to Resurrection Sunday, these eight days... They were eight days that literally changed the world. And so today I want to encourage you, as you see the events in this video of what took place on that day, what we call Good Friday, it wasn't good for Jesus, it was good for us. What he did was good for us. The sacrifice, the shedding of his blood, the Bible even says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So take a look at this. Reflect on what Jesus has done for us. Tell somebody, let somebody know. Call a family member that you want to share with. Uh, reach out in the best way that you can. Uh, let the church be the church on this day that we remember all of the sacrificial work and the redeeming work that Jesus actually did for us. And we ask you to pray. I'm gonna pray with you right now before we see the video. Father, in Jesus' name, we come before you and we just praise you and thank you. When I read your word and I understand what you have done for us, I give you praise and glory and honor. And when I think about the tearing of the veil, when I reflect on the fact that there was a veil between mankind and God in the temple and when you died on the cross, the veil was torn and the veil was opened up so that we would have access to the Most High God. Through 
Jesus Christ, we can access God. It's a miracle. So thank you, Lord. We praise you, Father. Give us grace. Give us mercy. Redeem us now in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all names. Amen. It, it was a different kind of Passover, to say the least. Um, I remember right when we sat down, Philip leaned over to me and he whispers, Hey, Thomas, I feel like something special is going to happen tonight. <laughs> I looked at him. I said, I doubt it. I was wrong. <laughs> Jesus got up from the table. He, he walked over and grabbed a basin of water and a towel. And I remember at the time thinking to myself, what's Jesus doing with the foot water? You know, I doubt he's going to wash somebody's feet. <laughs> I was wrong. He knelt down and began to wash Bartholomew's feet. Bart just sat there. He, uh, he didn't say anything. He didn't move. None of us did. Jesus finished and went on to James and Andrew and the rest of us. I remember at the time thinking, this is so strange, yet wonderful. And then I thought, I doubt anybody's going to say anything right now. I was wrong. <laughs> you know who broke the silence. Peter. No way you're going to wash our feet. I mean, that's what I told him. He could wash other people's feet, but he wasn't going to wash mine. I looked at him and I said, Jesus, you're not going to wash our feet. I mean, you're the king. And he looked at me and he said, well, then you can have nothing to do with me. And I'm like, ouch. Okay, wash my feet, wash my hands, wash my whole body if you have to. He looked at me and said, no, your feet will be fine, Peter. In the midst of him washing our feet, he teaches us servanthood. Then Jesus took some bread and some wine. He blessed it and he served it to us. He said it was uh, a new covenant with his blood. And he said, um, tonight, all of you will lose faith in me. I remember thinking right then, lose faith in you? Never. But I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there. I had to say something. So I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you. You can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled. He said, Peter, you'll deny me three times before tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray. Once we got to the garden, um, it's, it just got crazy. Um, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in the garden with him and pray, and we did. We tried. We kept falling asleep. Um, Jesus kept waking us up. I remember one time he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all a blur. Uh, <laughs> I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon. 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. The one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend? Uh, and then it, it got crazy. Uh, Peter, <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he, he cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus, Jesus just reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then, um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him, but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I 
I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that... I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus. I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. Didn't make sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotten in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, I mean, that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're going to say, let Jesus go. And then I was going to tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting, Barabbas. I mean, I mean, they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd and, and, they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, I mean one minute I, I am a man marked for death and then the next I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man. Hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath, and he said, it is finished. And then, he died. Surely. This man was the son of God.